Hello everyone, we are Team Waffles from Raffles Institution, consisting of Patrick, Aaron, and Wendolin. Today we'll be sharing about our hardware and software elements of our robot, as well as our strategies. First, we'll be talking about hardware. So this is our hardware diagram. Everything is pretty self-explanatory, but a few things that I'd like to point out is that two of the Lumas are connected via serial, and two are connected via I2C. The reason for this is because the left and right sensors were originally going to be were originally going to be VLs, but since the values were fluctuating very significantly, we decided we decided to switch to TF Lunas. Also, the Pro Micro reads all the temps in one loop and transmits the signal to the TNZ if one of the temps detects the boundary line. This is a failsafe to our localization function, which is the main function preventing the bot from going out of bounds. Uh, the next slide is a continuation of our hardware diagram. It's based, uh, but one thing I would like to Another thing I would like to add on is that we have added a capacitor, a capacitor this year to kick at a higher power. So the, uh, the slide after that will be talking about our top plate. Most of our components are connected, uh, are, are connected to, uh, to, to this plate since the teensy is on it. It has a really small footprint in order to prevent, prevent blind spots due to the tall motors and the smaller size limit this year. Uh, we had calculated the size limit in order to reduce the blind spots using Desmos. One thing that could be improved about this top plate is the placement of the of the components on on this plate. For example, uh, on the right side of the plate, it's uh, it's really empty because I had originally intended uh, for the Bluetooth module to be mounted there. However. I could have placed the Bluetooth module somewhere else, allowing for more space for other components such as uh, such as JSDs and just other components in general. Uh, th the next slide will be talk will be the overview of our bottom plate. Uh, we had relative ease designing this plate due to the large amount of space as compared to the top plate. However, we had faced difficulty in the placement of the capacitor due to its large size and the small amount of free space we had. Uh, one of the major problems we had with the capacitor was that it was too uh, is that when it was mounted vertically, it was too tall and it will often and it will often clash with the uh, with the camera which is mounted above, since the camera needed to be mounted a bit uh, slightly below the top plate. Uh, so in the end, if you could see two slides before this, we had ended up uh, mounting the mounted the capacitor flat on the on the plate itself. Uh, another thing that you will realize about the bottom plate is that there's a huge rectangular hole in the middle of it. Uh, this hole was originally for the old relay since it was too tall and it would clash with the with the motors. But we ended up switching to a smaller relay. Next, we'll be talking about our 3D printed mounts. Uh, the first one I would like to talk talk about is our motor mounts. Uh, our motor mounts are printed using ABS due to its high temperature resistance, since the motor gets really hot, uh, uh, really hot e very easily while running. So we couldn't use our, uh, the standard PLA, which we had used for our other prints. Originally, we had wanted to use VEX strips to mount it, where we would uh, bend it, where, where we will bend it into shape and then just uh, mount it. Uh, however, since uh, since I wasn't able to bend it uh, accurately, and since the holes, the mounting holes on the motor were too were too close to to, to its edge, we weren't able to execute this plan. Uh, next, we, next uh, will be the top hat. The top hat's uh, main purpose is to prevent excess lighting from entering the camera, causing the image to be uh, overexposed. It also uh, it also houses the IMU. Next will be uh, will be the camera top mount that has many functions, uh, such as it it's the it's the bottom mount for the tube, for the acrylic tube. Uh, uh, also, it's uh, the uh, the top mount for the camera. It also it also mounts a switch, and then and it also mounts the left and right lidar. It also has the option to mount the back lidar, but we decided against that since it would see half uh half wall half gold uh, next we'll be talk uh, will be the camera mount it's basically the bottom part of the camera mount uh, next will be the kicker mount it's it's right in the name it mounts the kicker uh, next will be the led ring mount it mounts the led ring since i didn't implement it into the plate design uh, it also 
uh, if you can see, uh, if you, if you look at it, you can also see the, the small cutout for the, uh, for the old relay that we, uh, that we had issues with. So, uh, yeah. Uh, next will be the side walls. This, uh, this helps to sandwich both the, both the batteries and the motor driver together, uh, since, uh, yeah. Now, moving on to our mirror. There are multiple types of omnidirectional mirrors we could have formed, but we eventually chose the hyperbolic mirror. Here's a comparison of the different types of mirrors and why we eventually chose the hyperbolic shape. A conical mirror, while arguably much easier to form, causes objects to shrink significantly as it gets closer to the center of the mirror, which will create a major blind spot for the robot. For a parabolic mirror, the robot takes up a lot of space in the frame, which is not ideal as we would like to have a greater view of, view of the field. Thus, we chose the hyperbolic mirror as it allows to see everything on the field which will be ideal in trying to find the ball. To ensure that the camera's vision is not blocked by any parts of the robot, we needed to make the mirror such that no part of the robot can be seen. We did this by finding the focal point of the mirror and drawing the rays out based on our camera's FOV. This creates a cone shape with our robot contained within a conical region to ensure minimal blind spots to the robot. After deriving the equation for our hyperbola, we can find the eccentricity and directrix of the mirror using the following equations in order to design it. Eccentricity as expressed as a constant ratio will give the number of points between the directrix, vertex, and focal point of the mirror. For example, if the eccentricity is 3 to 2, the distance between the directrix and the vertex will be 3 units, and the distance between the vertex and the focal point will be 2 units. Using this constant ratio, the gradient of the curve can be found. By marking out the intersection points and joining them together, the hyperbola can be formed. Next, we'll be moving on to the software components. First, we have our localization function. Our board has four LiDARs and the readings will be taken in from all four LiDARs via serial for front and back LiDARs and I2C via left and right LiDARs. The readings can be used to move to a specific point, for example the neutral points, and the readings can also be used to get the coordinates of the board since we already know the coordinates of the points that we want to travel to. Thus, we can use trigger to find the angle and distance the board needs to travel at in order to reach the point. We also implemented a slowdown function when we are within a certain radius of the point to ensure that the robot stops at the exact position and to, to, and to prevent jittering of the robot as well. Here you can see a video of our bot executing this function. Besides the move to point function, the readings can also be used to calibrate the bounds for each of the directions of the bot. This function is later used for confidence, speed control, and boundary control. Confidence allows us to determine the speed and the angle the robot should run at. Speed control caps the speed of the robot based on its position and boundary control pushes the robot back into the playing field when it is on the boundary lines. Confidence takes in both X and Y confidence. When the robot is not blocked, it has maximum confidence and hence will run at faster speed. However, when it is blocked, for example by another robot on the field, the confidence drops, causing the bot to move slower. Depending on which axis the confidence drops, the angle of movement will change. Next, for speed control, the speed of the robot is dependent on its position. As it nears the edges of the playing field, the robot will slow down to avoid it from running out of bounds. If the robot is moving towards the goal, it will also slow down along the arc around the goal. To calculate the arc, we determined the points we wanted to pass through and obtained the equation of a circle. The region bounded by our points hence form the arc that our robot would travel along. Due to time constraints, we were unable to try out other alternatives to find the best way to control the speed around the goal, but these were some of the ideas we had. Firstly, it will be to try out other points to form the arc to ensure the bot does not go too close to the boundaries in order to decrease the likelihood of it running out of bounds. Another idea which we had was to change the arc to a piecewise function such as a trapezium and seeing which worked better. Next, boundary control. As we know the coordinates of the playing field, we could get the robot to increase speed and push back into the field when it's along the boundaries of the playing field, preventing it from exceeding the bounds. Moving on to our camera. First, in order to ensure that the camera is able to detect the ball and go consistently at different positions, we created threshold values for each of the objects. This was particularly important for the ball as the HSV values fluctuated significantly as the ball moved around the field. Next, we have detection. Due to the possible presence of other objects that fall within the threshold of our goal or ball, we chose to identify the largest blob to ensure that we are actually tracking the goal and ball and not some random objects. Next, we have also mapped our pixel distance to real-life distance so that the bot is able to move to the correct real-life position of the ball or goal. We manually mapped the pixel to real-life distance for a few points and formulated the best line fit equation for, for the graph using the Excel sheet. We then populated an array with the converted distances for the ranges that the camera can detect 
to minimize the computational overhead. The values the camera can send is limited to a range of 0 to 127, but this is less than the maximum distance that the board can see. Thus, the pixel distance needs to be converted to real-life distance for the robot to move to the correct point. The direction of the object can also be found using Trigo by taking the pixel x coordinate and y coordinate difference between the object and the board. Due to the upper range limit, we decided to map the full 360 degrees of the uh, uh, direction to just 120 degrees. This means that we would have a lower resolution. We also created a mask in our camera code to mask the entire robot from the uh, camera's view to prevent it from detecting any parts of the robot as the goal of all. As you can see on the side, here is our camera in action. Lastly, we have our ball track. So using the camera, we can get the angle of the ball relative to the board. Our ball orbit function allows the board to slide just behind the ball such that the ball would enter the capture zone and start activating the dribbler. If the ball is in front of the bot, the bot travels in a curved path to slide just behind it, and if the ball is behind the bot, it moves towards the ball via an orbit. The further away the ball, the more directly the bot approaches it, since there is less likelihood of the bot hitting the ball as it moves backwards, and this allows us to get to the ball faster. Lastly, we will be talking about our strategies, some of which have we have implemented and some of which we hope to implement in the future. Here is the flowchart for our striker bot. It first checks if it's within the boundary before searching for the position of the ball. Once it has the ball, it checks if it's able to see the goal and will score, if it's close enough to the goal. And this is the flowchart for the goalie. It checks if it's within the goal bounds and also checks for the presence of the ball in the field. If the ball is not in the field, it will return to the center of the goal, while if it's in the field, the ball bot will defend the goal based on the relative position of the ball. If the goalie manages to intercept the ball, we will switch roles with the striker. And with that, we've come to the end of our presentation. Thank you for your kind attention.